Hello and welcome to Jewish science fiction and fantasy. Um, we're here to discuss exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, and let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, uh, let's start by going around and introducing ourselves and if everyone could share uh, your name, pronouns if you've got them, and a very brief mention of the, your relationship to the panel topic. So I'm Ruthanna Emrys. I am a Jewish science fiction and fantasy author. Probably the published thing that I have that is most Overtly Jewish is a short story called Seven Commentaries on an Imperfect Land that came out on Tor.com a few years ago. My next book coming out next year uh, is called A Half-Built Garden and is a first contact novel with a Jewish family being at the forefront of contact. <laughs> and my pronouns are she, her. <laughs> D.H. Hi, I'm D.H. Ayer. Um, my most, I'm he, him. My uh, most overtly Jewish stories are two short stories in my collection, Crossroads of Sin and Other Stories. Crossroads of Sin is the story of how a safer Torah was on the Santa Maria. Um, and there's another time travel story with the same time traveler to make that happen in time to sin when... Uh, I have Jack the Ripper go to the rabbi's house in Whitechapel. Thank you. Aaron. My name is Aaron M. Roth. I am Jewish and I am a science fiction writer and reader. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I don't currently have any, uh, none of my published work is explicitly Jewish, but I'm hoping to change that in the future. Valerie. Yeah. Hi, I'm Valerie Estelle Franco, she, her. I am the editor of a massive nonfiction series about Jewish science fiction and fantasy. So I have read pretty much everything on the big list, which I'm putting in the chat. And I'm collecting more books about Jewish SF and F also in the chat. And uh, please send me stuff. And my first book on this topic will be out any day now. So yeah, I've read it all. If you're, um, if you are trying to chat with the whole audience, please make sure that you have selected all panelists and attendees. That is not the default. Oh, and Valerie, what is the book called that is about to come out? Hmm. Jewish science fiction and fantasy before 1945. Well, hmm. Alex. Hmm. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Schwartzman. I'm a writer, translator, editor, and anthologist. Um, I translate from Russian, but I am a, uh, I'm of Jewish descent. Uh, and uh, Judaism appears in a number of my stories. Uh, perhaps the best uh, recognized of them is uh, The Golem of Deneb 7, which is also the title story of. Uh, one of my two short story collections, which is actually a science fiction rather than a fantasy story. And it deals with uh, the Judaism relation with what it means to, uh, you know, to, 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 to what family means and, uh, and, and how family ties work in diaspora. Uh, and uh, I feel that that's a very Jewish subject, but I'm sure we'll get more into that later. Thank you. So since Valerie brought up the long history of Jewish science fiction and fantasy, let's start with uh, two recommendations. Um, I, what have you seen out there in Jewish science fiction and fantasy? One work that you'd recommend that includes Jewish identity or cosmology or attitudes in a way that you like and haven't seen elsewhere? Well, it's a new one. Uh, the Way Back, might be 2021 or 2020, uh, was really impressive. It's children's, older children's perhaps, and we're doing the portal journey into the land of death, 
and the kids have magic and we're in the shtetl and it was just gorgeous writing and I can't recall the author's other book but I know I liked that too. So uh, I was talking to C.S. Friedman a couple of years ago when she was working on her uh, uh, Dreamweaver uh, trilogy. Um, her main character uh, discovers that she's not really from the family she's from, and she ends up uh, kind of replaying the life of Moses. So while it's not overtly Jewish, she is a Jewish Moses who has to go through the 10 plagues in the course of uh, the trilogy. Yeah, so one, one author I would recommend is Sarah Pinsker. Uh, and she actually has some Jewish stuff that I haven't read, but uh, one, uh, a book of hers that I would recommend, it's a short story anthology, Sooner or Later Everything Falls Into the Sea. Uh, there's some stories in there that are not Jewish, but there's also some stories in there that have some Jewish elements that I appreciated. I think she's also at this conference giving a reading at some point, so. Her father's also yeah, a rabbi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things I like about her books is the way that characters are often just sort of casually Jewish, like not in the sense that Judaism is casual, but that it's not a book about them being Jewish. It's a book about Jewish right. people having interesting science fictional things happen to them. Definitely. Alex? I'd like to recommend uh, a novella by Simon Rich called Sellout, uh, which is free to read at the New Yorker online uh, and was recently turned into a movie uh, called An American Pickle. Uh, of course, as is usually the case, the, uh, the story is better than the movie. Uh, and it has to do with the culture clash of uh, a Jewish uh, shtetl immigrant uh, in the early 1900s uh, versus a modern, uh, you know, a, a modern Jewish uh, hipster living in Brooklyn. One of the ones that jumped out at me was Marie Brennan's Natural History of Dragons series, which is a secondary world fantasy about a naturalist who studies dragons. And the default religion in that world is never labeled as such, but is clearly Judaism in the same way that the, the default never labeled religion in the back of a lot of secondary world fantasies has Christian assumptions. But you, you look at the different sects and the ways that they think about things and the practices that they have and it's all Jewish stuff and so the whole universe is just very quietly Jewish. <sighs> so there, there is a lot out there. What haven't you seen? What would you like to see more of in terms of representation of different aspects of Judaism that you uh, haven't seen a lot of. Hmm. Yeah, and the floor is open. We don't have a specific order here, so we don't need to wait to go down the table. Hmm. There's a little multicultural Judaism, and um, there are a few Sephardic stories. Um, Lee Bardugo, who just got a miniseries on Netflix has one, for instance. But when I looked for very, very specifically, did all my research looking for Jews from, you know, Iran and Iraq and that area, I found basically zero fiction, especially sci-fi fantasy fiction. It was pretty much all nonfiction. And I'm also, the own voices people are trying to do kids who are mixed race Jewish and kids who are bringing in half this culture and half that culture, but there really aren't that many. And a surprising one that I don't see in a century of this stuff is I see very few Jews in science fiction and fantasy praying 
or doing anything particularly religious. Almost all of them are, yeah, I left my Kvetching family lighting the Hanukkah candles and went out on the fantasy quest. I'd like to add on to that because something I was thinking of saying was that I'd like, I was thinking of maybe not saying it because there, there, are, there already are a lot of examples of this out there. But the thing that comes to mind when I hear, when I hear their question is I want to see Jews who are happy to be Jewish and proud of their Judaism and practicing their Judaism. Uh, because as Valerie said, there's a lots of uh, Jews in fiction who it's like, oh, they have Jewish heritage or it's kind of in the background and that's fine because that's also reality. But it'd be, you know, I think it'd be good to see people who they're, they're also actively living uh, Jewish lives. But um, yeah, I'm also worried about that being done wrong. So uh, in Chapter House Dune, they discover the Jews in the future because they find them keeping kosher. And then later on, they find them studying uh, Judaism, Talmud, secretly. Um, I, Wait, I guess. Really? I'll... Oh yeah. I I have not read the Dean book, so. Look, I oh, I've, I was starting to to uh, read science fiction. I was looking for Jews and Jewish themes, and when I didn't, when I found that there were no Jews in a Catholic world, it made no sense to me. And then someone said, "Oh, if you go twenty five books into the person series, you'll find a Jew." I said, well, I didn't get there <laughs> 25 books because I stopped reading after four, right? Um, but my Jewish identity was being built at the same time I was reading science fiction and fantasy. So I was constantly looking for the Jewish elements. Um, and like you were saying, there were times when you wouldn't find people who were particularly religious. You would just suddenly find that the character happens to be Jewish in the future and very non-religious. Um, I guess for me, it's uh, not finding uh, Jewish characters or, or in groups of Jewish characters uh, being uh, used as victims in a story, because so many of them revolve, especially anything that's around World War II, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so many of them revolve around showing uh, Jews as uh, oh, you know, these poor people are, you know, suffering and, and, and like this hero who is usually not Jewish is going to somehow save them or make things better uh, in the uh, alternate history or fantasy or science fiction uh, scenario that, uh, that is being proposed. Uh, and I would like to see, the, you know, more well-rounded characters and characters that can, you know, stand for themselves. One thing I'm always happy to see is a range of different experiences of Judaism. So it's always great to see Orthodox characters, but I very rarely see characters who are like, like myself, uh, happy Jewish practicing reform Jew or people who <clears throat> have have an experience of Judaism that doesn't revolve around the most the practices that are most obviously visible to outsiders. Yeah, we get a lot of oh, so much Hanukkah, but again as I was writing about all of this I was going, "Oh my gosh, somebody said Yom Kippur that rarely happens. They actually did an episode of Shadowhunters about Yom Kippur, which again seemed highly unusual to me on TV in a world where Willow once a season casually mentioned that she celebrates Hanukkah and that's all she ever does, ever, on Buffy. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's ironic, right? Because for anybody who's watching this who's not Jewish, um, Yom Kippur is one of the most important holidays in the in the Jewish calendar, and uh, Hanukkah. I mean, I love Hanukkah, but it's. Uh, I don't want to say I don't want to put it down by saying it's a minor holiday, but it's less important than Yom Kippur, and so. But it's more well known because it happens around Christmas time, so everybody 
knows about Hanukkah. Not everybody knows about some of these other ones. So it, it is it is sort of interesting to see. <laughs> it always struck me in Babylon 5 when uh, Theodore Bacall decides not to play an alien. He plays a rabbi, making sure Claudia Christian's uh, Ionova character sits Sheva. That you didn't come back to earth for your mom, Shiva. So I came out to you. And that's when you learn that it. Claudia Christensen, of all people, is the Jewish character on the show. No, and I would like to add that not only is her surname Christensen, but her Russian name is the most Russian name that you could they could possibly come up with and the least Jewish. Yeah, DH, you brought up an interesting point about the invisibility of Jewishness in a lot of especially older stories. And that's interesting because so many of the early authors were in fact Jewish, but it seems like the, the own voices movement has help people think about the possibility of actually including their Judaism in stories. <laughs> so well, if you look at the actors in Hollywood, the Jewish actors changed their names. Tony mm -hmm. Curtis was Schwartz. Kirk Douglas was Isyanovich, something like that, you know, Israelovich or something. I, and he couldn't get a job in Yiddish theater because they said he looked like a Nazi. So people were really had if you were Jewish, you had to look Jewish. Otherwise, the Jews wouldn't accept you as being Jewish. And yeah, 40s, um, half the authors are Jewish. Uh, just science fiction, if we think about it as American short stories going back to amazing and astounding and those. Yeah, all right, H.G. Wells and all those. But anyway, um, the American short story industry there, so many of the publishers, the authors, the creators are Jewish, but almost zero characters. You get some anti-fascist stories in the 30s and 40s, but you don't see Jewish characters walking around. That's really 60s, 70s when we start to see the Jewish characters. And it's pretty recent that we're starting to see the Jewish Narnia when we're seeing authors really feeling comfortable enough to say, yes, I have created a whole world about Judaism and my main character is Jewish. And yes, I have a place in sci-fi or fantasy. I'm going to do star glass where everyone on the spaceship is Jewish. Let's do this. But that's last decade or so. Uh, I'd like to add that the phenomenon of uh, Jewish uh, authors writing science fiction, classic authors, is not limited to the United States. Uh, it's the same in Eastern Europe as well. Uh, Stanislav Lem was Jewish. Uh, the Strogatsky brothers, who are the best known uh, Russian science fiction authors, were half Jewish. Uh, and there's a lot of other examples as well. So this is actually, uh, you know, a worldwide phenomenon rather than an American phenomenon. Thanks for mentioning them. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, it's very interesting that you say about all these uh, Jewish authors who are out there, but not necessarily writing Jewish stories. Uh, you know, my personal experience as a science fiction reader before I just like growing up as a person, uh, I was Jewish and I or I, I am Jewish and I was Jewish and I was a science fiction reader and I love science fiction, but they were kind of separate spheres of my world. And uh, I didn't even it didn't even occur to me that they needed to be put together. Uh, and it was really only recently that I became exposed to all the Jewish science fiction and fantasy that is out there, even though it's been out there for a while, it's definitely been um, not the mainstream, I think, until recently, as you said. And I write Jewish themes, and I write a, a background that is Jewish that no one but me sees is there, because I was Orthodox for 25 years, and I knew how I wanted my elves to be based out of the Torah. <laughs> So I used Midrashic uh, storytelling as the basis of how I wanted to create story. And that's what I've done for 21 books. 
And that brings up the, I think, relatively common in older works, and especially when you look at uh, early superhero comics phenomenon of <clears throat> the characters or the the species, the the aliens who are sort of covertly Jewish. So you have Superman who is an immigrant who um, gets, has to balance out the heritage that gives him his power with fitting into and being accepted by the culture where he lives, but who is definitely not Jewish. Except he has a Jewish name. Oh, and he's looking that to took marry. Me a second. <laughs> that was what was important to those writers. They wanted to be their character and they wanted to marry a girl who is a pure blood American girl, which is exactly what Schuster and Siegel were looking, you know, the kind of girls they were looking to marry. There's an excellent book uh, by Michael Chabon called uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, which really delves into the comic book creator scene, among other things, uh, in the, uh, you know, in pre-World War II. And uh, uh, it's really fascinating. And he really deals with a lot of the uh, subjects that uh, Rodana just brought up. And you get golems and mysticism and you, you get all the great stuff that comes with. Yeah, so what do you see is the, the different the different things that we get out of works that are overtly own voices where we can talk directly about characters being Jewish versus being able to point to the superhero or that alien and pick out aspects of Judaism that are sort of snuck in everywhere. <sighs> and is there still a place for the covertly Jewish alien in modern science fiction and fantasy? <sighs> well, Spock returned, so I guess the covertly Jewish alien who gets all the taunts about his different lifestyle on the bridge and so forth, is still doing his thing, although that wasn't really the focus of Discovery. Everybody's saying for own voices, kids, not just kids, but sure, kids, want to be able to see that, yes, you could be the hero. You don't have to just be the funny sidekick helping King Arthur get his start. It's okay for you to be celebrated and you to be awesome. I, th I think there's a place for both, um, for both the subtle and the, the explicit. Um, obviously, I like I think probably everybody else on this panel, I, I love to see more. Uh, I love reading and I love to see more uh, explicit Jews doing Jewish things as they're going out and doing stuff in a speculative world. Uh, but I, I also appreciate stories that incorporate these, what we might call Jewish themes that don't have Jews. Um, and I mean, particularly since there's probably a number of writers in the audience, I think people should write what they most want to write. Like I would, I would not want someone to put um, a Jewish character and make an explicitly Jewish character in a story with Jewish themes, if if they if they if they if they couldn't do it, I'd rather just have those subtle themes done well with an everyman protagonist than 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 a Jewish character done poorly. But uh, yeah, I also want to see Jewish characters done well. So I I I hope to read many more of both kinds of stories, frankly. And also, I mean, well, you know what we talked about earlier that one of the uh, one of the reasons that people maybe hid their Judaism was. Uh, explicit or implicit appeal to the masses. Um, and so I don't know how true that is today. I don't know how much, like if there's a Jewish protagonist that's like really Jewish and not just subtly Jewish, if that harms the mass appeal or not. But um, uh, I don't know. I don't think it's wrong to take that into account, even as I'm saying, I want to see certain kinds of stories. Along those lines, um... Laurie R. King wrote 
uh, the Mary Russell Sherlock Holmes stories where Mary Russell marries him and she's Jewish. Uh, I think it was playing off the idea that Irene Adler captured Sherlock's uh, attentions and she was Jewish, uh, even if she was uh, a bad guy in the original series. But uh, those books went on for a very long time uh, at every bookstore I could want to pick one up. So I'm starting to see uh, questions coming in. Um, it looks like our first question, uh, does anyone know from Aaron Canton, does anyone know of any stories that get Kabbalah right? Hmm. Yeah, a few. An old story with right? Valley, Valley first, then BH. <sighs> um, B season is not that fantastical, but it felt very Kabbalistic as it played with words. That's a mainstream novel and a movie. The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman had some interesting vibes. I'm trying to remember, there was kind of a recent middle grade series set in Tenement, New York, where the granddad is explaining to the kid that yes, we have Kabbalah magic, but part of our respect for God is not using the magic. We just study it in a hands-off fashion, I'm trying to remember the name. And the last one is not Jewish, but the comic Promethea. I was really impressed by how they climbed the Sephirot and had an adventure at every level, and that, man, had that person studied Kabbalah. Yeah, Alan Moore is, uh, it was a beautiful series. I, there's a whole possible separate topic about non-Jews getting into Kabbalah as a ceremonial magic thing and treating it that way when there are, from a Jewish perspective, very specific constraints on who and how it's supposed to be practiced. I mean, it's- Well, there's, it's not, there's a, not an understanding of Kabbalah. There, there's not necessarily a real understanding of what Kabbalah is. Or how it fits into the rest of Judaism. DH, you also had some suggestions. I, I just remember a book from the 70s, uh, Face in the Frost, where the main character is really in big trouble and he ends up coming across a, a, a Kabbalistic rabbi who says, You got to do this and then you'll be able to do that. And I was like, Where did this rabbi come from? And he's suddenly here. And he saves the day by giving the answer that the protagonist needs. Uh, I can't remember who wrote the book, but uh, I just remember that when I was 13 or 14, it made a difference for me. Yeah, there's also a book by Matthew Kressel called King of Shards that is uh, a Jewish Narnia in the sense that it's an alternate fantasy world that runs on explicitly Kabbalistic principles. And the, the forces of darkness are trying to kill the just people whose existence keeps the universe going. It's a really fascinating set of world building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll find Lab and Vovnik approaches uh, even in TV series out of nowhere. There was uh, a show by um, Kiefer Sutherland that was on for one or two seasons and they discover his son, and they're not a Jewish family, is one of the Lamed Vovniks who knows the math upon which the universe was created and everyone are trying to get that number. And people are killing off Lamed Vovniks and the Hasidim save them once or twice and hide the family out because they say, oh yeah, your son, even if he's not Jewish, is a Lamed Vovnik which I thought was interesting, very interesting. Yeah, I'm also wondering, someone brought up Helen Wecker's The Golem and the Genie in the comments, which is a brilliant book. And I wonder if that might count as something that handles Kabbalah well, not in the sense that it's 
got Kabbalah constantly woven through it, but it's one of the few things I've seen that takes seriously the, not just, oh, golems, yes, that is a Jewish fantasy creature, we can use those, but the mythology uh, and folklore around the magic that gets used to create them and the ways that that can be a uh, not great idea. <sighs> Uh, we also have a question about translations. Miriam Nadel asks, is there any SF being written in Hebrew or even modern Yiddish? Yiddish, not a lot. Although if you go back a century, if you happen to read it, um, the Yiddish book project does have fantasy books and early science fiction from like 1920 and 1900. I have found some titles that I could message you or something. And Israeli science fiction and fantasy are different than American. There's a lot of magical realism, a lot of dystopia, a lot of you're sitting on a bus for an hour and this guy will not shut up. And then at the end of the hour, you find out he was deaf and you're all dead or something. But Israeli fantasy is going strong and shout out to Zion's Fiction. That is a pun. Um, a collection of Israeli fantasy that gives you, you know, a sampler and then you can check out all the authors. Book two is coming really soon. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's mentioned Lavi Tidar, who is, who is an Israeli um, science fiction and fantasy writer, but he lives and writes uh, in the UK. Uh, so he has a lot of stuff that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's set in the Middle East that, uh, uh, that draws on Jewish themes. Um, but also uh, there's a number of works um, uh, in translation uh, by Yefim Zazula, who is a rather obscure but very important uh, early 20th century uh, short story writer in Russian. Uh, he invented the concept of anti-utopia, uh, which inspired Zemetian to write we, uh, among other things. And some of his stories are actually retellings uh, of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the Torah stories. So he has a retelling of a Cain and Abel story. He has a retelling of the story of uh, you know, Moses's last days and them coming back to, uh, you know, to the land of Israel after many years in the desert. Uh, and, and it's a fascinating uh, view of how sort of this, uh, this Russian Jewish uh, author who was born uh, still during the, uh, you know, during the Russian Empire and, uh, and lived through the revolution and uh, that really influenced his writing and his views. Uh, how he's approaching those themes. Uh, I've been working to translate some of those stories. Uh, haven't sold the the Cain and Abel one though I have translated it, but I do have the the story that inspired uh, We is actually coming out from Tor.com uh, early next year. Though that story is certainly not uh, overtly Jewish like some of his other works are. Uh, James Morrow uh, had a story published in Fantasy and Science Fiction last August in his uh, Biblical Tales for Adults which are really just set satiric tales with a kernel of uh, truth to teach people. Jawbone was the story that came out. Um, I read it and did a presentation for Bisbis, uh, for, for, for uh, a synagogue in Baltimore uh, after being approached by Bisbis, a member to talk. And uh, it's called number 37, but he doesn't write, he, he, there might be only five of them. He's got another one coming out, but He's been writing these stories to show people they have absolutely no idea what the stories are about and uh, misunderstand them. And then he puts really unusual satiric twists to them. Uh, Jawbone is how the Philistines used all this stuff from Samson to make uh, munitions out of everything to conquer the world kind of thing uh, until Samson brings it all down. So. Uh, and the angel of death is telling the story. So it's really satiric, <laughs> but it actually is a very can wonderful actually, story. Can I expand on the question about translation just a little bit and ask if anyone is aware of good stuff in translation coming from outside Hebrew and Yiddish? You know, we, we are everywhere, at least a little. Mm -hmm. Well, Stanislaw Lem and uh, the, uh, I can never say their name, the Russian brothers have Probatsky. been mentioned. 
um there's a lovely um lady from morocco i'll try to find her name but yeah americans don't get as much as we should Uh, there are a number of translations from Russian uh, that are by Jewish authors, but they're not necessarily uh, covering Jewish themes overtly for all the reasons we discussed earlier in this panel as well. And then uh, more speculative or maybe philosophical question from Celia Greenberg. Why do you think so many Jews have gone into science fiction? We're always looking for a hopeful future. We want Jews to be in it. But sometimes you have to write negative ones in order to, to make people go, I don't want that future. Let me try the, try the more democratic one or this or that. Yeah, I think the, I mean, I think hope and like hopeful futures and sort of more dystopian futures both play a role. I mean, Judaism has always been a religion that has been future looking. You know, there's a the concept of the Messiah and the messianic age. Uh, in Judaism, it, it doesn't necessarily get talked about a lot, but there is this idea of looking forward to the future um, and sort of hopefully in that case. Uh, and then in a more practical level, there's a sort of, oftentimes I think Jewish communities have had some fear about the future, not like in an abstract sense, but about very specific things, but connected to sort of themes that that something might reoccur in Jewish history uh and also and and so that can come out uh in, in science fiction I think can be a way to talk about some of those themes in a way that maybe society could accept um also normal fiction can be a way to talk about those themes in a way that society can accept um and I'll, you know just there's if you look about it, a lot of the Jewish themes that I think happen in the Jewish experience throughout history uh, fiction is a great way to talk about them. And I think a lot of people also want to talk about them in, in, in speculative fiction. And I think also the sort of the Jewish historical sense might play into that as well, because I, I, I do think there's a relationship between sort of having a sort of sense of history in the past and having a sense of history in the future, or even a sense of alternate present. And so the fact that there is a lot of, you know, memory and historical memory uh, in Judaism and the fact that we have these founding myths uh, or, or, or not myths, depending on your theology, but the fact that we have these founding stories, um, I think that, that those are awesome things that, uh, that play a role, that could play a role. Lou in the comments brings up something that I was thinking as well, that the experience of yeah. Jews in diaspora is itself a fairly science fictional experience. Right. Um, being being outside, trying to understand and adapt to new settings and new cultures and that alienation by itself opens up some room for speculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being being the other, but not com but uh, yeah, a lot of the complexities of Jewish experience. Yeah, flipping around from Jewish writers to Jewish readers, uh, I'm curious how you feel that Judaism affects your reading and your fan engagement. Um, a lot of people consider fan fiction to be somewhat Talmudic in nature as we try to interpret and reinterpret texts. Um, the whole idea of bringing together a panel where people can argue about what a, a text or a story means seems a little bit Jewish in its way. Yeah. So do you, think it, do you think it changes the way you read things or, be, or watch things? Absolutely. Fanfic goes so well with Midrashim. And another place I see fanfic having fun is dealing with the Judaism. I mean, Next Generation threw in 
Worf's parents are Theodore Bikel and a Yiddish comedian, and that's all they said. They never said anything else. But you can find fanfic where Worf is celebrating their holiday of uh, their ceremony of Tashli or something. Likewise, J.K. Rowling said, yes, there is a Jew at Hogwarts. I'm done. But you can get fanfic where he's celebrating the holidays and dealing with his practices. There's so much out there. Um, I have a slightly different perspective on this in that, uh, you know, I, I'm Jewish and I consider myself to be, uh, I consider that to be a nationality and, uh, and, and a culture, but I'm not particularly religious. So I have a slightly different view of it. I don't really practice uh, as a Jew, but but I certainly uh, am steeped in that culture, and I'm sure it influences the way that I both create uh, content and consume content. But I don't think it's really through the prism of of belief. It's more through the prism of uh, of uh, family experience and 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 like the all the information and all the things around me, uh, the you know the, the Jewish things around me that have formed the that have contributed to, uh, to, to forming my personality. Michelle in the comment says, isn't rabbinic Judaism all fanfic? <laughs> uh, no, because uh, fan fiction is written by people who are writing fiction. The, uh, the rabbis who wrote the Talmud were writing to their mind theology or or nonfiction. So I don't think it could be called fan fiction. Not necessarily science fiction, but I do. So every year at Passover, we read the story of Moses parting the waters everyone goes through and the Pharaoh's troops get drowned. And then every year, at least in my Seder, we read the little bit of Talmud that is, and after that, everyone was dancing, and God said, why are you singing and dancing when my own children just had to die? And every time I see that, I think, you know, we're taking that seriously, but it's also fix it stick. It's this story is meaningful to us, but we want to make it better match the values that we now have. And I right. do see the connection. I don't think it's dismissive to say that, that's that a goddess, I mean, that's midrash turned into commentary mm -hmm. that we've then said there's a kernel of truth uh, and we're going to use it. But there's also a danger of taking uh, those stories that we hear in religious school based on a midrash and saying that's what it says in the Torah, because often it doesn't say anything at all. And that's why someone added a midrash in the last thousand to two thousand years to address something that there just wasn't addressed but it's one of the reasons i love midrash and why i think of some of what i write as midrash rather than uh and storytelling rather than traditional science fiction or fantasy Also, go read The Kosher Guide to Imaginary Animals if you want to see everybody wrangling about the logic. And that does, in fact, bring up, we're coming down to our last five minutes, and um, that's a perfect seg into the last question I wanted to ask, which is... What is your favorite science fiction or fantastic Jewish conundrum? So, you know, our dragons kosher can dragons light fires on Shabbat. It doesn't actually have to be about dragons, <laughs> but this has been um, uh, something of a Jewish hobby and fanfic for a while. <sighs> Look, my pet peeve is who did Cain and Abel marry if they were only boys? And when I look at a science fiction story and have, you know, I have to kind of keep that grain of salt in there that we don't know everything. <laughs> and worrying about it apparently didn't bother <laughs> Moses at all. <laughs> Maybe it was so, aliens. Maybe it was dragons. 
it's easy to picture all the accommodations you have to do on the spaceship and yeah okay hologram candles and the list goes on and on and we actually see Worf who's trying to do his ritual fast and do his job and so on playing with some of these concepts some people have compared him to a ball to to Shuva who didn't grow up with the culture but now that he's gotten now that he's grown up he's throwing himself into it as far as he can go a few years ago uh we had this fabulous uh facebook thread uh, which started out uh, with a lame joke about circumcising a dragon uh, and went on into all sorts of logistical and theological arguments about the validity of it, of whether the dragons would become Jewish, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that thread birthed at least, it, it actually, I believe it birthed multiple short stories by multiple authors, and at least two of them uh, were published, including a flash fiction of my own, but also a very good story by Esther Friesner, who should have been mentioned on this panel already because it's uh, you know she writes a lot of uh, you know a, a lot of Jewish themed stories and a lot of Jewish themed humor in particular. Uh, so if you if you care uh, about the subject, uh, you could look up both of those stories and I'll see in the chat later. I'll uh, I'll share a, a conundrum that I think about a lot because I really like to think about practicing Judaism in space, and if anybody wants to talk about it, feel free to contact me through my website because I love to think about it. And I think about it a lot in an alternate universe. I would become a rabbi who thinks about it, but instead I'm just a normal person who thinks about it. So here's one of, of multiple things I think about. So there's this idea, and I thought about doing something simpler, but I respect all of you, so I'm not going to do something simpler. So there's this idea in, in traditional Judaism that on Shabbat, uh, then the day of rest, you're not supposed to carry an object from a private domain to a public domain. That means like if you have a house, if you live in a house and you have whatever, a bowl or something, you're not supposed to carry it onto the street, which is a public space. We won't go into why that is, but that's a rule. Now your porch can count as your private domain sometimes. Your roof also, your roof counts as part of your house. Your lawn if it's enclosed, it might count as part of the domain. If you don't have a fence and it abuts the street, it might not count as part of the private domain, even if you own it. So what happens if you're on a spaceship? If you're on a space shuttle or a space station or something, and what does the outside of the space station count as? Now let's ignore the problems with going through an airlock on Shabbat, of which there are numerous, but let's pretend somehow you get out there. Does that count? Can you take an object from inside the spaceship to outside of the spaceship if you follow this uh, Jewish practice? Um, that's something I think about a lot. So, Do 40, uh, four cubits distance. Fine. Well, <laughs> but that's if you got off, if, if your ship came so in, let's, let's say this is a big ship on Shabbat. You can't get off if you're Orthodox. No, I said ignoring Shabbos. that. I know I said ignoring that issue. That's a separate issue. We were limited to one conundrum today. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, Bob, right, I had the same question. Yeah. We are on our last minute. So um, any last thoughts or things you want to share very quickly? <laughs> Copy the chat, copy the chat. It's so big. You can meet us on Discord. In which room? After the panel? Uh, probably Baltimore too. Did somebody throw a Discord link into the chat actually? In just one moment. Thank you. So also the host, uh, can the host enable copying the chat? Someone asked for it. I'll email All right. to people if they ask me. If you click on the three little dots towards the bottom right and say save it, then it will save it for you. Yeah, it seems to be enabled for me. All right. And I'll be in the, I'll be in the Discord room and uh, gather town also. You'll be able to find me I and gather. This part as well. Hmm. All right. Thank you all. Shabbat shalom. Hmm. Shabbat shalom.
Have a wonderful weekend. That's Maybe right. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>